Good afternoon, everyone. Hello, my name is Bob Rasmussen, and I'm the dean of the USC Gould School of Law. And it is my pleasure to welcome you to the law school's third annual Supreme Court preview. This is a wonderful audience that we have here today. It's composed of law students, undergraduate students, faculty members, friends of USC, and alumni. Indeed, we have two special alumni here today. Um, they're not only alums of our law school, they also serve the university as members of our board of trustees. We have Stanley Gold. <laughs> and John Kuzmirsky. And it's an honor and a privilege to have them with us today. And indeed, it's an honor to have all of you with us today. In a short time, only three years, I think this has become one of the signature events at USC. And I think the reason is because it's the hallmark of what we try to do in terms of legal education at USC. It is an education that is rigorous and engaged in very important and timely events. Indeed, today, with all the tumult one hears in the political sphere, it's very important for the law school to engage in rigorous analysis of the important work that the Supreme Court does. In terms of the format, Today, I'm going to introduce the moderator, my colleague, Elizabeth Garrett, who will then introduce the remainder of the panel. Elizabeth Garrett clerked for Justice Thurgood Marshall on the United States Supreme Court and, Justice Stephen, and Judge Stephen Williams on the D.C. Court of Appeals after she had received her J.D. degree from the University of Virginia Law School. After working for four years with Senator David Boren of Oklahoma, Beth joined the University of Chicago faculty, where she eventually served as Deputy Dean for Academic Affairs. In 2003, we were fortunate to allure Beth to USC. And at USC, she has served a number of important roles, including her current one, which is Interim Senior, senior, uh, senior Academic President and no, vice, president. Vice, president, <laughs> vice President and Provost. Sorry about that, Beth. We got a promotion. Um, Beth is a leader in the field of law and politics, so she's a perfect moderator for this. Um, also, Beth has served as a visiting professor at a number of leading law schools and institutions, including Harvard, the University of Virginia, Caltech, the Center for Interdisciplinary Studies in Israel, and the Central European University in Budapest. Beth? Thank you. Thank you very much, Dean. Welcome to the Supreme Court Preview, which as Bob Rasmussen just told you, has become a tradition here at the law school and at the university. It's our third year, and I think we really have to thank our colleague, Rebecca Brown, who inaugurated this tradition. It's one that I'm very glad that we have. And we are now looking at the term that will begin in a few weeks. It's the sixth term for Chief Justice Roberts, and I think in many ways this can be seen as truly his court. Last year, he was in the majority 90% of the time. It's the first time in 34 years that, that Justice Stevens will not be sitting on the bench. He's somebody who's traveled from when I clerked to being an idiosyncratic moderate to somebody who was seen at the end as the leader of the liberal wing. And so it'll be interesting to see what happens in his absence. And then finally, we have a new justice again this year, Elena Kagan. And not only is it noteworthy that she's a new justice, but it's the first time that we've had three women justices on the Supreme Court, including, <laughs> well, that's right, we're replicating this, uh, including, of course, a relative newcomer, Sonia Sotomayor. And as always, or at least since Justice O'Connor retired, there's the perennial question of what will Justice Kennedy do in any particular case. So we'll be exploring many of these issues today, but before we start, let me introduce the panelists here. It's really a terrific collection of legal academics and people who have appeared before the court and will continue to appear before the court this term. We'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, first, we have John Eastman, a leading expert on constitutional law. He was the dean of the Chapman University School of Law until January 2010. He left to run for attorney general. I would listen to him on NPR, and it's <laughs> terrific to have him back with us. Uh, although, sorry, I can't vote for another law professor <laughs> at the election. Uh, he's the director of the Center for Constitutional Jurisprudence, a public interest firm uh, affiliated with Claremont Institute that he founded in 1999. He served as a law clerk for US Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas and for Judge Mike Ludig on the US Court of Appeals for the Fourth Circuit. 
Uh, after his clerkship, he practiced for the national law firm of Kirkland and Ellis, specializing in major civil co and constitutional litigation at both the trial and appellate levels. Next to him, we have Kathleen Sullivan, a nationally prominent scholar and professor of constitutional law at Stanford Law School. She's an outstanding litigator who's argued before numerous appeals courts and the U.S. Supreme Court. From 1999 through 2004, Sullivan served, Kathleen served as the 11th Dean of the Stanford Law School and the first woman dean of any school at Stanford. She's now a partner at Quinn, Emanuel, Urquhart, and Sullivan, and she's been named one of the 100 most influential lawyers in the United States by the National Law Journal. And then we have Rebecca Brown, my colleague, and a nationally respected constitutional theorist whose scholarship focuses on judicial review and its relationship to individual liberty under the U.S. Constitution. Rebecca clerked for U.S. Justice, Supreme Court Justice Thurgood Marshall and U.S. Court of Appeals Chief <laughs> Judge Spotswood Robinson III. She also served as an attorney advisor of the Justice Department's Office of Legal Counsel. Rebecca and Bob joined us a few years ago from the Vanderbilt Law School, and we're, both, we're lucky to have both of them here as our colleagues. We're going to run this in a slightly different format than you may have seen in some of uh, these kinds of events. What we're going to try to do is have a discussion among the three of our panelists. I'll throw out some questions, I'll direct it to one of the panelists, but we're re I've really encouraged all of them to feel free to follow up on what someone says, to, to uh, come in with a different approach to things, to have a conversation that uh, we will ask you to join in the last 20 or 25 minutes of today's uh, presentation. So let me begin with a few questions that are a bit retrospective before we turn to the upcoming term. And John, uh, actually Kathleen, let me ask you, what do you think the, the big cases last year were? And what do, should we expect now that they've been decided? So often in the Supreme Court cases we lose track of them once the Supreme Court's decided, but it's often interesting to think of the aftermath of those cases, either when they go back to the courts or when they're back in the legislative arena. Well, thank you, Beth, and thank you so much to USC and to the Dean for having us all here. Uh, uh, two big cases that surely everybody heard about last year. One was McDonald versus City of Chicago, the gun control case, the case that said that now that we've said that the right to keep and bear arms is a right against the federal government that belongs to individuals, in this case involving DC, does that also apply to the states and cities? Can you also challenge gun control regulations enacted by the city of Chicago? And the answer the court gave was, yes, this is a, an individual right that is so-called incorporated against the states and cities under due process. It, it is a fundamental liberty to be able to keep and bear arms, especially for self-defense. And so Chicago's effort to say that the use of guns by individuals actually increases violence rather than protecting people from harm was not a sufficient reason to keep this out of being a fundamental right. Now, as Beth says, what happens on remand? Well, now we have the hard part, which is now that it is a fundamental right, what government interests could still trump it? Uh, can you have a regulation against drinking and carrying in a bar? Can you have a regulation against assault rifles and AK-47s? Can you have a, a, a regulation against carrying guns in cars? There's a whole variety of gun control regulations that might still pass this t heightened scrutiny that we apply to a fundamental right, and that's a job for the lower federal courts. Second big case that everybody heard about last term was the campaign finance case, Citizens United, which actually turned into Citizens Divided because people <laughs> had so many critical views about it and everybody in Congress on the Democratic side was racing to try to overturn this decision by constitutional amendment or statute. What did it hold? It simply held that corporations, whether they're GM or the ACLU or the NRA, corporations, whether they're for-profit or non-profit, can't be made to segregate money they want to spend for political advertisements into a separate segregated fund, like a political action committee fund. They can spend it from their own treasuries. And this was greeted as if the sky was falling and an avalanche of corporate money was now going to flow into politics. Now, of course, that misses a few key points. We already had corporate money in politics. We had corporate money in politics through donations to the Chamber of Commerce or other trade associations that are still the preferred vehicle for much corporate spending. And it isn't like corporations are just going to spend everything they make through their surplus on political heads when it could go to, say, executive compensation <laughs> instead. <laughs> so the idea that we're going to have this avalanche of money going into politics is a bit overstated. But I want to just point out, Beth, that the two really striking features of these decisions are look 
who was doing the judicial activism. For so many decades, we've talked about judicial activism like it's a bad thing, or like it's a thing that only liberals do to strike down laws prohibiting abortion, or to strike down laws prohibiting radical speech and flag burning. Judicial activism has become a label that's applied so often to liberals who use the First Amendment or due process to strike laws passed by Democratic majorities down. But these two cases involved five to four conservative majorities being activist in striking down a law of Congress, and not just a law of Congress that was a few years old or a few decades old, not just BICRA or the McCain-Feingold bill, not just aspects of the Federal Election Campaign Act amendments post-Watergate, but actually aspects of our assumptions about corporate spending that go back to the uh, Tillman Act of 1907. So this was activism on steroids, and it was also activism to strike down, in the, or, or at least to subject to heightened scrutiny, the gun control law passed by the city of Chicago. So if you want to pick a key theme for the, what's happening at the Supreme Court now, it's that the political valence of judicial activism and judicial restraint have shifted political sides. You now have judicial activism coming from the so-called conservative side. It was due process that even Justice Scalia agreed, reluctantly, was the basis for applying the right to bear arms to the city of Chicago. Due process, that same source of the contested right to abortion. And it was uh, the conservatives who really sided with freedom of speech in the, in the corporate campaign finance case. Now you also have the, a president and his party who are trying to pass the most ambitious social agenda since the New Deal. Now they want judges who are going to be deferential to the work of political majorities and exercise judicial minimalism and judicial restraint. So sometimes you can't be sure of who's reading from whose playbook in these current cases. It all seems topsy-turvy, and I hope we'll talk more about that later. I, I do John. want to take that up. You had me going until the activism discussion. Uh, <laughs> I agree. Um, I, 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 I don't think it's right to define activism as striking down an act of the majority. I mean, uh, uh, what, what one looks at to try and decide what's an activist court or not is using a nebulous, amorphous, uh, unspecified clause in the Constitution to create uh, some right uh, from a penumbra or an emanation to use that self-defined right to strike down an act of the majority rather than the text. But to strike down an act of the majority because it violates the text of the First Amendment or violates the text of the Second Amendment, even if it took us a while to get there on those issues, I don't think defines judicial activism. I think it defines the duty of an independent judiciary. Um, I will agree with you that I think the reasoning in the, uh, the McDonald case to apply substantive due process uh, turns Justice Scalia's an, uh, antipathy toward Lochner on its head. Uh, I was involved in that case. We filed a brief arguing that they should uh, revive the Privileges and Immunities Clause because it was clear as an original matter. It wasn't just one of many things that we had the Privileges and Immunities Clause for. The lead issue was the disarming of former slaves in the South that led to the adoption of the Privileges and Immunities Clause. If here was an opportunity on originalist grounds to recover a long lost clause of the Constitution that would appeal to the originalists on the court, this was it. Only Justice Thomas uh, took that position in the case. Uh, none of the other members of the majority did. Rebecca, any ideas of cases that that will have continuing relevance? Well, I just, I, I don't, I think those clearly are the, are the big ones, but I wanted to just mention one thing that I that has struck me about the gun case, um, in addition to what uh, both the others said, which is that even in the original case when the Supreme Court for Justice Scalia recognized the right to the se to a Second Amendment individual right in the Heller case the prior year, um, it's the first time I, correct me if I'm wrong, but it's the only case I can think of in which the when a right, a fundamental right was recognized for the first time, the court in the same breath that it recognized it acknowledged, but of course it, the states have to be able to regulate some kind of gun owner. It was an ex almost a carving out of the very creation of this idea of a right. So it's a different under, so the fact that it's incorporated and now we have to go through this new process of litigating in the lower courts to figure out what regulations are gonna be okay, you'd never hear that. Uh, discussed as sort of, you know, it's a fundamental right to free speech. But of course, the, the government can control it. Now, it may be, of course, that in all rights, we eventually do see regulations that come along, and sometimes they may survive scrutiny or not. But it's, I thought it was a very interesting conceptual difference about this right, that the court almost invited this kind of future litigation Kathleen was talking about by identifying this as a different kind of baby in a way, that it's going to be one that already comes into the world 
knowing that it's not a fund it's not it's fundamental but not absolute and that the, the d distinctions between what kinds of restrictions are going to be allowed and what aren't is is everything as far as what this right uh, means to us I think let me ask one final retrospective question then we'll turn to the coming court what I always think is interesting is what is the case or cases that were decided that we didn't think are a very big deal that in five or ten years we will think of as a very important case and, and as someone who teaches administrative law I always think of the Chevron case which when it decided, even John Paul, uh, Stevens, who wrote it, did not think it was a big deal. It turns out it's now one of the most influential and cited and important cases that the Supreme Court's uh, handed down in, in uh, our modern times. So what's the case that when we all get together again in five or ten years, we're going to look back and say, we should have known that one was a bigger case? John? You know, I think there are a couple. I think Padilla versus Kentucky. Uh, dealing with ineffective assistance of counsel claims are, is going to have a lot of ramifications. It, n none of those cases are going to be the ones that make the front pages of the papers, but for the day-to-day -day practice of law in the, on the criminal bar, that's going to be a big one. I think another sleeper is United States versus Comstock. This was where the court upheld uh, a statute by Congress um, that somebody that's in federal prison and then gets out uh, could be immediately re uh, recommitted uh, civilly. Uh, that pressed the limits on civil liberties, but also pressed the limits on federalism and some very interesting original things there. There's a lot to that case that can have some pretty profound implications if, if the holding is given its full scope that we may be talking about down the road a little bit. Kathleen? Yeah, I'd agree with the Comstock case, and, and let's just put that in focus a little bit. The Comstock is a case that holds that the necessary and proper clause of the Constitution of Article I, Clause 8, uh, Section 8, Clause 18, is sufficiently broad that it gives Congress the power to regulate federal prisoners not only when they're in federal prison, but after they're released. It allows a district judge to remand a sexually dangerous criminal who's served his prison time to a, a civil commitment. Now, necessary proper clause is, is you know, this is dear to somebody who publishes a con law casebook because it justifies putting McCulloch versus Maryland in the front of case, <laughs> the casebook and making students read about the necessary and proper clause, which was held broad enough to uphold the power of Congress to charter a national bank. But the reason why it's relevant now, I can give you in, in two words, uh, health care. Health care. <laughs> that if Congress has the power to reach beyond its enumerated powers to control federal prisoners, to give federal courts the power to civilly commit prisoners, which remember, normally we would think of as a state function, not a federal function. There's no civil commitment clause in the federal constitution. There's no provision for civil commitment under federal law generally. This suggests that there's going to be an elastic interpretation of the necessary and pro proper clause for other contexts. And obviously, the cases have already begun in the lower courts. One's already survived a motion to dismiss in a Virginia district court. Uh, challenging the new health care reform legislation that Congress enacted and the President signed this past year. If necessary and proper is broad enough to cover sexual predators, it may be broad enough to cover other things. Now, why is this significant? Well, probably the hallmark of the Rehnquist Court, if you think of the single biggest constitutional innovation of the Rehnquist-O'Connor Court, it was a revival of limits on federal power in mm -hmm. the name of states' rights not just new doctrines like state sovereignty or prevention of commandeering of state officials, but doctrines like the limitation on the power of Congress to enact gun control in schools or civil damages for date rape or domestic violence. These were notions that said Congress is not a general government of plenary power. The federal government has limited and enumerated powers. And the court struck down a number of laws in the name of states' rights. It became extremely aggressive in striking down federal laws. Federal laws were struck down maybe once every 10 years in the 19th century and six a term at the height of the Rehnquist Court. So Comstock may be the sleeper case that says the Rehnquist federalism revolution is over. Congress now has broader power. Uh, it will receive deference in areas it might not have received from the Rehnquist Court and watch this space for whether that applies to health care reform. Rebecca, do you have a favorite sleeper from last term? Well, it's hard for me to predict how many things on the ground are going to end up making a difference. I think that the, uh, the holding um, that uh, life without parole for juvenile offenders is a, is a significant holding. I don't know if it'll last or, or have tentacles the way we're thinking now, because I, I don't know the criminal justice system on the ground well enough to predict that, but I think it, uh, as a theoretical matter, the idea that something short of uh, 
murder uh, would be subject to this kind of Eighth Amendment limit it, with a 6-3 uh, majority, I believe it was, by the Supreme Court is significant. And I thought that it, it may um, you know, join and maybe even tend to help expand this set of uh, Eighth Amendment cases having protecting juveniles and protecting against the death penalty. Thank you. So now we'll turn and look forward. And what I'd like to ask each of you to do is to talk a bit about what you think the noteworthy cases of the upcoming term will be and help us know what to watch for as we watch the court and as we watch the coverage of the court. And Kathleen, why don't we start with you? Sure. Well, video game violence <laughs> is a case that now has reached the Supreme Court. There's a case that has been granted sir, from the Ninth Circuit involving the question of whether government is free under the First Amendment freedom of speech to regulate the targeting of video games that have violent content at minors. Now, where does this come from? There's an old view that certain kinds of speech are less protected than others. Obscenity, for example, speech that is sexual in content and appeals to the prurient interest may be okay for adults, but there's long been a, a case called Ginsburg against New York that said that you could e regulate even more sexual speech if it's directed at a minor audience, an audience of under 18-year-old people. But that doctrine has never extended to any other kind of speech. There's never been a kid exception to the First Amendment in any other area. Even in the area of commercial speech, you can regulate speech that is generally directed at illegal transactions, and some transactions are illegal as to minors, but you can't ban all smoking billboards or, or tobacco product billboards near schools just to try to get at preventing targeting speech to, to minors. Uh, the, uh, video game case asks the question of whether there's going to be any relaxation of that general presumption that kids are protected by the First Amendment too, and that government can't do overbroad regulations as an a effort to keep bad, bad speech for minors. So I, I think it's unlikely that there's going to be a new kid exception to the First Amendment. The other thing that the court did last term that suggests that it might even affirm the Ninth Circuit here rather than take it to reverse uh, is that last term there was a terribly unpleasant, difficult to think about case about films of animal cruelty, a federal statute that criminalized the, per, the portrayal of animal cruelty. It may have been directed at certain kinds of sexually tinged animal cruelty films, but it was worded so that it would cover even dog fighting videos. And the court very lopsidedly struck it, uh, sorry, upheld the law, rejected the challenge, saying we don't have new unprotected categories of speech, even for very unpleasant forms of speech. So I think the court has been very pro-free speech in this area, and it's hard to imagine that even with a mountain of evidence that California will present to say that violent video games in, incite children or, or inure children to violence, it seems hard to believe that this court, which has been so pro-free speech, even in the area of animal of dog fighting videos, is now going to say video games can be regulated. Uh, so I, I think it's going to be a tough sell for California. The, te the technologies of it, though, are, are interesting. I mean, the, the, the average age of the, court, age of the court is in the 70s, and I remember when I was there more than a decade ago, one of the first uh, porn on the Internet cases came up, and, and um, the justices had a hard time getting their hands around that there would be porn on an <laughs> Internet. They didn't quite, because the idea of computer images conveying porn was foreign to them. Um, and they actually had to ask supplemental briefing uh, for, for, with, with CD-ROMs, and I happened to be walking by the, 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 uh, the viewing room when Justice, I won't say who's, which Justice it was, was in there. Oh, my. <laughs> um, but, so the, the, the technology is not caught up with the court necessarily. Um, uh, and and uh, another story on this, when, when Chief Justice Rehnquist found that, uh, that somebody could go on the Internet and find his home address, uh, his solution to that was to cut the court's computers off from having access to the internet, <laughs> as if that solved the problem. Uh, so there really is a bit of a disconnect on the technology things that come on. Um, but, but, you know, we don't have Joe Camel on the billboards anymore, and I think the court may be willing to say, you know, the, the, the cruelty of the animals case is different than when we're talking about protecting children. I don't know. I mean, it's, I think it's going to be cl a close case, though, um, because, you know, you've got this trend, certainly from the obscenity cases, but it seems the harm to children is what was driving it, not that it was uh, sex rather than violence that was causing the harm if you look at the underlying rationale of those cases. And so if they think if they tease out that rationale, they could uh, say that, yes, this statute is going to be upheld. John, did you have another case of First Amendment? The, yeah, Snyder versus Phelps. And so this is a case that's gotten some news. Uh, 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 a church that protests our involvement in wars. 
um, by protesting the funerals of soldiers who have, who have died or been killed over in Iraq or Afghanistan and come home. And they're, and they're very over the top in their protests. Um, and and uh, there was a, a, a suit brought for intentional affliction of emotional distress by the, the parents of the, of the military serviceman who was killed. Um, and they won a, a fairly significant award, both uh, compensatory and punitive damages at the trial court. But the Fourth Circuit reversed, saying that there was a First Amendment protection for the protest. Um, and this, I think, case is putting two fairly significant constitutional ideas or norms or rights at, at uh, odds with each other. The right to unfettered speech, but also the right to be just left alone and have some sanctuary of privacy, particularly in, in matters as so um, uh, grave as, as the conduct of your funeral for your son or your daughter who's just lost their life uh, overseas. Um, and I, I'm predicting that the court's going to come up with something like this. That although the protest was on the public street, it was a public street that was being used at the moment for a funeral procession. And at that point, that public street is not a public venue for speech, but is a private room, just like if it was the church at the funeral itself. And we're going to find out some way to reconcile the, the speech uh, interest as well as the privacy interest at stake there. I don't know. We've urged them to do that in our amicus brief, but I, I think that may be where the court goes. Because uh, if... if the, the lack of civility that will flow from an unfettered, uh, absolutist view on free speech here, I think, will just uh, get worse and worse and worse as time goes on if they don't go come up with something like that. The problem, or the interesting thing to me about this case is that really I think if you, I mean, maybe the court can dance around this somehow. I don't, I, I'm not sure if it'll be able to, but if it's honest, the court has to admit that the thing that's objectionable about what the, these protesters did was based on the content of what they said. It's not that they were making noise. It's not that they were interfering with privacy. It's not that they were showing up uninvited. Any of those sort of secondary effects that we sometimes will allow regulation of. The problem is what they said. And they said, your son is going to go to hell. And they said, I don't know what else. All horrible things. And that's the source of the emotional distress that these parents got compensated for. It was the content. So that's, I think, which sh sh shocks us all about what was done to this family who was grieving, was what was said to them about their their dead son. So to me, what's interesting about this is that there's a very strong intuitive appeal here for the idea of regulating content, re regulating speech based on its content for the reason that it, the thing that is said is harmful to someone else. And you know what that sounds a lot like? Hate speech. And the court has never been interested in upholding regulations on hate speech because we have an absolute freedom of speech in this country for the most part. And it has been very reluctant to to ever say that something that can be said to someone can be so harm producing that it's re worthy of being regulated. But you know, if they do it here, that is a, an opening toward um, some other kinds of content-based regulations. For better or worse, I mean, there are people who think that would be a bad thing. I, I'm not so sure, but I think it would, we'd have to see how the court dealt with it. But I think it's fascinating for that reason because there's such an emotionally intuitive case for the regulation of content, which is very foreign to our American culture of free speech. Rebecca, do you have another case for us? Um, I was. I think we were going to move to the immigration oh, cases next. Kathleen? Yeah, immigration, John. Oh, that's right. So we got the immigration case. So it's pretty clear we've rehearsed a lot. Yeah, we've. <laughs> and I've got to remember the name of the case. No, um, all right, so uh, Arizona, I don't know why Arizona keeps doing this. I guess they want to be in the forefront of Supreme Court precedent on a number of fronts. Um, uh, Arizona has decided that if you hire uh, an illegal immigrant without running the name and the credentials through this, the federal uh, employer verification system, um, that you lose your business license in the state of Arizona. Uh, and the issue, and the, and the Ninth Circuit upheld the Arizona statute. So the issue now presented in the case before the Supreme Court, uh, Chair, Chamber of Commerce versus hmm, Arizona. Candelaria. Candelaria, thanks very much. Um, is, is whether the federal statute, which has a preemption clause uh, that prohibits states from adding civil or criminal penalties to the federal enforcement regime, also includes the state's decision to revoke your license, which is not a civil or a criminal penalty. 
Um, and of course, lurking in the background is SB 1070, which is the Arizona enforcement of illegal immigration, federal law, uh, the, the things that made all the headlines over the last six months, the, the uh, conducting an investigation if you have a reasonable suspicion that somebody is here illegally, um, impounding the cars if you're using them for transportation or harboring of illegals, uh, sanctioning the, the uh, employee as well as the employer uh, for working if you're not legally authorized to be here, the requirement and a state law crime if you don't carry your papers that are mandated by federal law. Uh, that's now pending in the Ninth Circuit, but we all expect that that's going to get up to the Supreme Court as well. And we'll see a lot in the tea leaves of what the court thinks about that case um, by how it deals with this, uh, with this one on the employer verification. Other cases? Sure. I guess I was, mine is, the one I want to talk about is really, it has something to do with the very nationally salient issues of citizenship and immigration also, but it's not really in the same realm. It's, it, it's interesting because it's the first case I know of in a decade that has raised uh, an equal protection claim based on gender. We just don't see those very often um, anymore because it's kind of pretty obvious that, you know, statutes aren't supposed to on their face make classifications based on gender, and for the most part they don't, but there is, there are some that do, and this one is being challenged. This is a federal law. It's a rather narrow situation, um, but has, I think, significance to uh, sort of expression, significance perhaps about what it does. So it applies when a United States citizen ha with, uh, let's see, how do I use it? United States citizen partners with someone who is not a United States citizen overseas to create a child who is born overseas out of wedlock. Okay, so got the situation. It's a rather narrow setting, but it still actually happens to affect quite a lot of people. So a, a U.S. citizen is, has a child out of wedlock overseas with, and the other parent is a non-U.S. Uh, citizen. The question is, does the baby get citizenship, a U.S. citizenship, uh, through the parent, through the U.S. citizen parent, which normally you do get if your parents are married, or if um, whatever, if you uh, if you're born overseas and your parents are married over there, or if you were born here, we get birthright citizenship. So the question is, does the baby born out of wedlock to these two people, one of whom is a U.S. citizen, does that person, by just by virtue of the one parent, get citizenship him or herself? And the answer is, it depends on whether the not the parent, who's the U.S. citizen, is a man or a woman. And that's kind of interesting, huh? Yeah, I'm hearing a lot of uh, <laughs> response from the crowd. Okay, so that's why this is an interesting case. So, so to complicate matters, so it turns out if you're a man, if you're the father in this situation, you have to have not only be a U.S. citizen, you also have to have resided in the U.S. for 10 years, five of which have to have been after age 14. So that sounds weird, but it, it, in effect it means no, no parent under 19 could ever qualify and anyone else, even if they are over age, um, have to have been a resident of the U.S., lived in the U.S. in addition to being a citizen for, the, for 10 years. For a woman, it's one year. Big difference. So this is a very sad case, actually. So if you know the facts, but I won't go into them now because of time, but th that's how the issue was presented. So what's interesting, so this, the legal setup is that in 2001, the Supreme Court had resolved a case involving a sim somewhat similar issue, a different part of the same statute. And the thing, and that part that they addressed in, the, in that case, the court upheld. It was another gender discrimination or distinction in the same situation, exactly the same non-marital um, situation, but that one set was a requirement of um, the father, if, uh, if they met the, sat the requirements, the father had to prove me with re uh, clear and convincing evidence that he was the parent of the child before the parent, child could be considered for citizenship. The mother didn't have to make any showing of parentage. That was the, the one that was addressed in the former we, case. Because we typically know who the mother is. On well, the, that's the, the, what the, the court birth. said. <laughs> but that's yeah. exactly what the court said. It was Justice Kennedy, and it was a 5-4 decision, and the, and the court said, we know who the mother is, and the mother knows she's a mother. We don't know necessarily who the father is, and remember we're talking about unmarried fathers, so they're saying they, the father may not even know he has a child, whatever. So. The court based it on what they called a biological distinction regarding literally presence in birth or participation in birth. The mother is necessarily there by definition, the father is not, and therefore has to prove that he is there. And 
has the opportunity, as the court said, for establishing a relationship with his child, which Congress thought important for its citizens. Okay, so that was the background. The court upheld that law five to four. Now that case is not in dispute. They're not challenging, they're trying to seek to overrule that. They're just saying this is different. And what's interesting to me about it is, at least the petitioners claim, that this statute I described with the time, the 10 year re residency requirement, they say, is not, has nothing to do with a biological dif difference. This one has to do with a connection between the parent and not the child, but the country. Why is a woman's connection to her country established by only a year of citizenship, whether it's a man's connection to his country is, it takes 10 years? That's the issue that they're addressing now. And the reason that I think it's particularly intriguing is it happens in the first term when we have three women on the court. So not only that, but the prior case where they upheld the law, Justice Stevens was with the majority. He upheld the law. He was replaced by Elena Kagan. Interesting. The only problem with going really that too, too much into that is the other person um, in dissent, the, the dissent in the um, prior case included Justice O'Connor. And she was replaced by Justice Alito. And we don't, wouldn't expect him to, to vote with the dissenters. So we could still get a 5-4 split, a different 4. Um, but I, here's my question to you. Will Justice Kennedy, who wrote Nguyen, the prior case, Will he allow himself to write an opinion, the first gender discrimination case of the Roberts Court with all three women in dissent? I think that's an interesting question, <laughs> right? So maybe he won't. I mean, he obviously will have to decide. He's the swing vote in this case, as in so many others. But So we'll see. So I think it's really going to be fun to sort of watch that and see what the latest word from the Supreme Court is on facial gender classifications. Just a quick word on gender in the Supreme Court. The women don't always vote together, that's for sure. But on gender issues, uh, Justice O'Connor and Justice Ginsburg tended to vote together quite regularly and systematically. And last term in Justice Sotomayor's first term, I saw a statistic that she voted 84% of the time with the majority, which is a striking way for the new kid on the block to fit in. Uh, and also, uh, but exceeded that for voting with Justice Ginsburg. She voted with Justice Ginsburg, her mm. other only fellow woman on the court, 90% of the time. So it'll be interesting to see if these alignments yeah. persist. And in fact, in, in full agreement cases, uh, the uh, Ginsburg-Sotomayor uh, collaboration was the strongest on the court last term. Um, Justice Scalia and Thomas voted on the same side of the case, but oftentimes concurring separately or concurring in the judgment. <laughs> But the, the strongest alliance was uh, Sotomayor and Ginsburg. Kagan won't be able to vote on this one. She's recused. So, oh, we, so Kennedy only has two. Oh, <laughs> has oh good point. Uh, I forgot about but, that. But, but I agree with you. I don't think the biological connection that drove the reasoning of the prior case has anything to do with this one. I think you may have an, uh, an eight to zero case here. Yeah. Can I add, uh, as I listen to you all talk about Justice Ginsburg and Justice Sotomayor voting together, when I clerked on the court, there was very little interchange among the justices outside of the formal interchanges, outside of the conference. Do we have any idea whether or not, with some of the justices now younger, some, uh, you know, like, uh, well, we don't know about Elena, but somebody, who, she has a, a history of wanting to talk to people, bringing consensus. Do we have any idea, any sense, those of you who follow the court, whether there's more informal interchange, which I understood went on more in years before I clerked, than certainly were happening when I clerked. And we know, for example, that Sotomayor and Ginsburg are talking to each other outside of the formal interactions. There's, there's a political science study that needs to be done that, that looks at vote alignment based on location of chambers. <laughs> um, be, because, because you're right, there's very little uh, other than the formal communications. There's the uh, they don't get together before the oral argument, which surprised me. I thought they would have tried to get together and narrow the issues down on where the areas of disagreements were to focus your argument. None of that happens. There's very little substantive discussion at the conference after the cases. It's basically, I would affirm, uh, I think uh, those are trucks and these are trains and there's a difference. I mean, there's not, not much uh, discussion and it goes in seniority order. Uh, at the conference. Most of the interchange comes after a draft opinion is circulated. I can agree with everything except part 2B. If you change that, I'll go. And you're very accommodating until you have your fifth vote, and then much less so after that. But there's a theory that the com conversation that occurs after you step down the f from the bench while you're walking in the back 
corridors to your chambers uh, is actually a little bit of ongoing uh, informal. And so seeing who's on which side of the court, which, who's walking next to each other with the chambers uh, would be a wonderful study. And I don't know where Sotomayor and uh, Kagan ended up. Uh, uh, so it'd be fun to find out. I'll have to, f I have to I'll learn that. I'll check it out. We have political <laughs> scientists in the audience, Got so it. I think they'll be working on that. It'll be interesting, too. I remember stories about Rehnquist going in and talking to clerks when he was first uh, justice. And you know, I can, again, imagine on Elena Kagan having that sort of influence with people outside of the justices. But let me go on and let's talk more about this term. I know, Kathleen and John, you both are involved with cases that are in front of the court this term. And I wondered if you talk a little bit about those cases. Kathleen, maybe we can start with you. Sure. Well, it's my privilege to represent Wyeth, which is now owned by Pfizer this term, in a case that I think affects everyone in the audience with children. I'm defending the uh, National Vaccine and Vaccine Injury Act against, uh, I'm saying that it preempts state lawsuits that in which a, a parent comes in and says, well, I want to sue the manufacturer because I think the vaccine my child received was de defective. Well, if you think about the importance of childhood vaccines, which you know have grown in number since we were all, all children to the number that you have to take your, your children for today and the automatic and regular immunization schedule, we take it for granted that we've practically eradicated all kinds of contagious diseases through these uh, the use of vaccines and and when there's ever a lapse in vaccination we see the outbreak the terrible outbreak we have right now in the valley of whooping cough we have a pertussis epidemic going on in california with four over four thousand reported cases and nine infant fatalities when we ever relax a vaccination schedule where we don't have enough vaccines or people don't take care of vaccinating their children you can have sudden out outbreaks of contagious diseases that we thought were eradicated. Well, uh, I think my role here is to argue that federal preemption here is a good thing for uh, all concerned because it, it, what the federal government did is 30, 25 years ago, it set up a scheme called the Vaccine Court, where if you do have an injury from a vaccine, if you're one of the rare parents whose child did have a, an injury from a vaccine, you can go get swift uh, compensation from this administrative mechan mechanism. But the kind of in exchange, the federal government, the Congress, the Congress in passing this act said, we're going to preempt, we're going to prevent state lawsuits in which people try to come in and say, well, we think the design of the vaccine that the federal government approved was defective. It, it, it preempted so-called design defect claims. That's our argument. Now, the other side uh, will passionately argue that there ought to be state lawsuits that are allowed nonetheless, despite this express federal preemption clause. So let me just take a, a step back. I, I think actually on this side, both the uh, people who generally favor federal preemption because they think it's good for business and it prevents having 50 state regimes or even more to the point, some aggressive states like California from driving the national agenda and, and hurting business. It will take the people who usually favor federal preemption and I think it will also align the people on the court who are very pragmatic and think, well, this is a very good solution that actually benefits parents and keeps manufacturers in business and is good for children. So I'm hoping it will be a lopsided vote in favor of preemption. But let's take a step back and talk about this. It sounds kind of boring, federal preemption, the idea <laughs> that a federal statute will trump either a state statute or a state common law cause of action. It's actually become a huge, again, point of contention on the court in which we've seen people f switch sides. I said before that uh, the Rehnquist federalism revolution may be dead, and we also now see conservatives who used to embrace states' rights eagerly embracing the idea that federal law, the law that brings about the Hamiltonian national market, <laughs> displaces the balkanized law of the 50 states. And so that's a funny change, and it's very, uh, whereas the pe who's embracing federalism now? Actually, a lot of times the people who embrace states' rights might be the proponents of what you'd call blue states' rights. <laughs> You know, the, the states' rights of states that aggressively go after bank lending practices or states that allow you to sue cigarette manufacturers for calling cigarettes light when they still have uh, ingredients that might help cause you uh, serious disease or states that allow you to sue a drug manufacturer that didn't tell you that an anti-nausea drug might cause your arm to get gangrenous and need to be amputated. These are all, I'm, I'm stating the facts of three cases in which the court upheld state claims against the argument that they were federally preempted. And so there, there, there's a funny, and, and who voted for those cases? All the justices who used to say we're against states' rights in the old red states' rights cases. So again, a flip-flop in which you see on the Supreme Court an interesting dynamic where the proponents of federal power, 
which used to be a liberal cause, New Deal, Great Society, Civil Rights Acts, federal power being the thing that, that was embraced on the left, you now see federal power being embraced by members of the so-called right, and you now see people who are advocating, saying, no, there's room for the states here, or often people coming from the political left. That's another way in which the Roberts Court just defies ordinary political labeling and in some ways has, has, has reversed. There's a couple of cases to watch this term uh, that are, besides our case, there's a case about shoulder belts. So just to prove my point, there's a case about whether uh, a state cause of action saying, uh, you should have told me I wear, should wear shoulder belts when I'm in the back seat, and you didn't, and I got hurt, and now I want to sue the manufacturer. The manufacturer said, the federal government told us we didn't have to have shoulder belts in the back seat. The federal government approved uh, a set of safety regulations that require lap belts but not shoulder belts in the back seat. And so there's an implied preemption of the state law claim. Well, guess where the administration is? It's not defending the federal preemption <laughs> argument. It's in saying, oh, no, this is not preempted. So the administration may have some friends in the trial bar that might be interested in bringing some of these suits and also some sympathy for people who want to still get access to justice in the state courts. So I ask you to look at this and tell me, is Kamala interesting or what? Right? <laughs> and people flip sides politically, and that's why calling the court right or left is so misleading. And, and I, I guarantee you I'm going to be using those briefs by the Department of Justice in those cases in the Arizona case where they're <laughs> arguing exactly the opposite side. So it'll be great fun. Can I just say one thing not about the cases that I want to hear? what John has to say, but um, the, uh, I, I was just thinking about the demographics. I mean, the big proponents of states' rights, we always thought it was conservatives versus liberals, and we kind of associated the states' rights argument with the conservatives, because that's where it happened to be with. And now we're kind of having to rethink that. But when you think about the people that have left and the people that have replaced them, I mean, we had Justice O'Connor, who was a state politician, we had Justice Souter, who was a state uh, Supreme Court just, judge and attorney. attorney general of his state in New Hampshire. Um, we had Rehnquist, who I don't know that he had a state history, but he was very committed uh, as a theoretical, as, a, as you said, as an idea to states' rights. And um, we've replaced them with people like Justice Roberts, Alito, Sotomayor, and Kagan, who have been <laughs> devoted, particularly Roberts and Alito, devoted their careers almost entirely to the federal government and they really see things through a federal lens so they could still be conservative but they don't that aspect of what we used to think of as conservatism doesn't seem to have carried over with them so it's almost you know a function of how how homogeneous our court is in the sense of people who have all had experience with the federal government and on the federal courts and no state politicians no state uh, uh, judges even so it gives us a sense of needed diversity on the court. We yeah. need people who know how to use the internet, <laughs> and we need some state legislators. John, tell us a little bit about your case. Well, I already talked about one of them that we're involved in is an amicus curiae, Snyder versus Phelps, uh, and another one, Arizona Christian tuition case I'll talk about in a moment. But I want to talk about the case where I was going to represent the party and, and argue that they didn't take, because I think it, um, it hammers home the point that the old Rehnquist uh, states' right federalism revolution is over. Um, uh, this was a case, uh, we've got a federal statute, RELUPA, the Religious Land Use and Institutionalized Persons Act. Um, that was an attempt by Congress to get around a, a, a prior Supreme Court precedent uh, in, in the free exercise of religion cases. But they used a broad understanding of the commerce power to regulate zoning involving churches, and they used a very broad understanding of the spending power uh, to condition, um, to, to, to regulate in ways that the court had said they could not, but tie it to federal spending programs. And, and, and it's particularly interesting because the Rehnquist Revolution, I think, um, largely turned on limiting the power of government under the Commerce Clause. And the big open question was, if you don't um, take that reasoning and apply it to the spending power as well, then all of this is for naught because the federal government can just say, I'll take that same condition you just struck down in the Gun Free School Zones Act and tie it to your education funding and I can, now can do exactly the same thing. Or take the same conditions on, on, on date rape uh, in, that they struck down in the Morrison uh, case and tie it to federal spending of whatever uh, and, and, and do the same thing. So it was clear if this revolution was going to have any staying power, they would have to confront the spending clause. And not just in, in, in any spending issue, we were looking for a case where it was spending on quintessentially local stuff. 
No business, no economy, no commerce. In fact, something that was quintessentially a core state function, the running of a state prison. Uh, prisons don't run in interstate commerce. The people that are there don't transfer across state prisons, uh, well, across no. state lines. <laughs> we thought we had the perfect case. And when it came up four or five years ago, the parties hadn't uh, challenged the spending aspect of this. And so the court said, uh, we're not taking it up here because the parties haven't raised it and the lower courts didn't discuss it. But we recognize there's a significant issue. This was a huge invitation for future litigation. And so we've got this spending case out of South Dakota on Ralupa. And they denied cert. I mean, it, it's always, you know, there's, there's never going to be a case that was more squarely presented than that one. And they take it. They took a parallel case only addressing state sovereign immunity, but without looking at the underlying spending issue. And so I think truly the Commerce Clause limits on federal power revolution may be dead. Maybe it'll come back in the healthcare stuff, but I think uh, Kathleen's points about that earlier uh, may be solid. Now let me, let me go to the other case that we're involved in as, as a friend of the court. The amicus uh, Christian tuition case. So in Arizona, again Arizona, <laughs> uh, uh, these all come by way of the Ninth Circuit though, so they can be part of the Ninth Circuit docket. And we probably should uh, touch just on that a little bit. Um, the Ninth Circuit has become the butt of jokes about so frequently reversed. And I want to I want to say to my friends on the Ninth Circuit, and even those that are not so friendly with me on the Ninth Circuit, that some of the uh, the claims against the Ninth Circuit have been grossly exaggerated. There are more cases taken by the Supreme Court from the Ninth Circuit every year because the Ninth Circuit is double or triple or quadruple the size of any other uh, circuit court in the country. So one would expect more cases, and one would expect more reversals because there's you know there's a pre predisposition that we're taking the case to reverse or to correct. Um, so that's not what gets the Ninth Circuit in trouble. The number of summary reversals, 9-0 reversals, or not even bother to go to oral argument reversals, um, that, that they win by six-fold over the next second base circuit is what has earned its reputation. Now, last year, the Ninth Circuit only had 18 or 19 percent of the cases up there. Already this year, and we haven't even gotten to the start of the term, 43% of the cases that a cert has been granted come out of the Ninth Circuit. There are uh, 13 circuits. That's right, that's right. 40% so, yeah, so, so the Ninth Circuit looks like it may be on a pace to set some records here. Yeah. And Arizona is certainly helping with that. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but the Arizona tuition case involves whether you can have a, a, a private nonprofit entity uh, where I donate and then they give scholarships out. The parents that apply for the scholarships then get to use the scholarship at a school of their choice. Overwhelmingly, those schools are religious in nature. Does the fact that the state of Arizona gives you a tax exemption for that donation uh, violate the Establishment Clause? And I think the court has already addressed this in the Ohio Zellman versus Simmons Harris case a few uh, decade ago now almost. Um, but this one's a little bit different, so they could find ways to distinguish it. But I think I think they're going to uphold the Arizona statute on this. John, could I ask you: Is is there an allegation that the setup, this vehicle by which private people give money to this thing that's not? A state entity, and that, that that thing disperses it. Was that intentionally set up to avoid establishment clause, or do, is that part of the record? Well, it's it's not part. There's there's some new statutes. There's been some um, claims of abuse with the system. So um, I've got a kid getting ready to go to college, and maybe you've got a kid getting ready to go to college, and you donate because I can't give the scholarship to your kid, or you can't give the scholarship to your kid, and I can't give mine. So you donate to give it to my kid, and I donate to give it to your kid, and we accomplish a tax deduction on our tuition. Um, so they, they passed a statute recently to kind of tighten that up to make, make that less possible. Um, but I get 100% write-off on the monies I donate to this. And so one of the arguments is I'm fostering or encouraging this kind of support for parochial schools, um, that the state is doing the encouragement, uh, and that therefore it violates the Establishment Clause. But the Supreme Court in the Zellman case was very clear. The percentage of uh, a money that goes to the parochial schools is not what the driving uh, issue is for the constitutionality. It's whether the decision maker, the parent or the private entity, rather than the government, is where it's driving where the money goes. And I think here, the set, I mean, you know, the, the lurking issue is can I inquire into the state legislator's intent? Did I know this with an eye wink that a lot of it was going to go to? But you start getting into legislative intent. There's a huge slippery slope of you know that that the court has pretty traditionally tried to avoid going down. 
Before we turn it over to the audience, let me ask you one final question. Uh, there are a lot of cases, we've actually referred to a couple of cases that are not yet before the court, but we all expect might get there. Uh, one that was referred to are cases that come out of the health care bill. Another uh, that we've discussed are the immigration cases that seem to be leading up to the most recent uh, issue out of Arizona. And the one that we all think a lot about here in California, we're all Californians, is, are the cases that come out of Proposition 8. So I wondered if, and in, in, before we turn it to the audience, if you guys would say something about some of these cases, and in particular Prop 8, because we haven't discussed that at all. When do we think it's going to come to the court? Do we think that it's going to come to the court? In Prop 8, of course, there are really two issues. One is the issue of same-sex marriage, which is now squarely presented, perhaps. I guess there are some questions <laughs> about that. Uh, and there's also the question of disclosure, the, the, whether or not uh, it, it, there's an issue when those who contribute $200 or more are disclosed, now that we have internet, it goes back to technology, and you can put these Google Maps up and we can find out where everybody contributed, people have taken actions on the basis of those contributions. Yep. So we've got a lot of things that we have coming up, and I wondered if you all would like to address it. Rebecca, why don't we start with you and then come this way? Well, um, the, I mean, the sort of law professor's dream issue on this right now in the Prop 8 case is, I don't know how well um, publicized it has been or not, but is the question of who is allowed to take an appeal from the district court's decision in San Francisco striking down Prop 8. Um, the reason it comes up, and this is so rare, is that the, um, the state, the, the action, the initial lawsuit was against the state, of course, for, to keep them from enforcing Prop 8. And so it was Schwarzenegger named party. And so he was the named defendant. Uh, the people who put Prop 8 on the ballot were allowed to intervene. Uh, but they weren't really defendants, but they chose to intervene because the uh, government of California didn't want to defend um, the, the, uh, the merits of Prop 8. So in order to get that defense pr provided, these people were allowed to intervene. There was standing for, th for the case, though, because Schwarzenegger was still a party. So there was a, there was a live controversy between the plaintiffs and the defendants. And once there's live controversy, other people can come in, even if they don't I independently have standing. But now that the case has been decided, the governor has decided, and the attorney general have decided not to pursue an appeal. That's a choice they make in tons of cases, um, right, whether you appeal a, uh, a a disfavorable verdict is something that uh, you always have to make judgments about the cost and the benefit. So for whatever reason, they chose not to do it, which means that it wouldn't be appealed unless the interveners took the appeal. And so the interveners took the appeal, but the, the really the first question before the Court of Appeals at the Ninth Circuit can get to it is whether they have the right to, because th the nature of an equal protection challenge like this is, I mean, there's sort of a procedural and a substantive component to this. The procedural component is just, is, it, is there standing in the technical Article III sense? Is there, contra, you know, is there an injury to the party who's bringing the appeal, a concrete injury? And it's a little hard for the, for the proponents, maybe you'll talk about this, John, the proponents to articulate what the injury to them is if uh, the decision go, is uh, left standing. The substantive part of it, which will get more, if they're granted standing, they get more to the argument of, of why you know, they should win the case. They have to argue that the state of California has an interest. That's what an equal protection challenge is, right? You claim an unequal treatment, and then the state comes back and says, well, this is my reason why I have to treat you unequal. Maybe it's at a low level of scrutiny. Maybe it's at a high level of scrutiny. Right, but the state, the burden becomes on the state to say this is the public need for this inequality, and then the, the court evaluates whether the justification is sufficient. That's how an equal protection challenge works. It's a little weird, and I don't quite know how to think about it when someone who has no authority from the state, these are private people, I guess, how that person can come before the court in this kind of challenge and say on behalf of the people of California, that this is the interest we are promoting. It's just so weird because of the initiative process. And of course, the people of California did express a, a view through that election. So it's not crazy. They didn't just come off the street and say, I'm speaking for California. But it doesn't fit 
our sense of sort of what the theoretical idea behind an equal protection challenge is, which is that sometimes you have to sacrifice your rights for the sake of the common good and sometimes you don't. And the question is, what is the common good here and who has the right to say what it is? Because obviously there's a disagreement. So that's yeah. what I find about it. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. So, so the, the Ninth Circuit, just to pick up on the standing point, the, the Ninth Circuit has asked for briefing on this question of whether there's a live case or controversy. Uh, and that will be part of what goes forward on the appeal. The Ninth Circuit did stay the ju decision Judge Walker made holding that equal protection is violated by a restriction of marriage to men and women and not being extended to loving couples of the same sex. So that, that's, that's where things are. So it may fizzle. There may, the case may go away for lack of appellate standing and it may never get to the Supreme Court. But I do think that, you know, I think what Ted Olson and David Boyes, that uh, odd couple of American jurisprudence <laughs> did in coming together after being so divided in Bush v. Gore and coming together to argue this case and put on a, a trial in, in San Francisco that was uh, so remarkable in the way in which it ventilated, what possible effect on anyone else could a loving marriage between two people of the same gender possibly have? And if the answer is not much, then it's an equal protection violation. And they did an incredible job on this trial, and it created a, 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 a large record. And the big, the big question is, if it goes up to the Supreme Court, what will Justice Kennedy do? And uh, because the court is likely to be divided 4-4 or otherwise, in a decision about uh, seven years ago, the court remarkably, in Lawrence versus Texas, did hold that the Constitution bars the application of a criminal sodomy law to uh, private consensual adult same-sex conduct. And I think that although that opinion, which was authored by Justice Kennedy, was very careful to say we're just deciding that there's a libertarian right to consensual sex in one's own bedroom that the state can't be involved in, it was very careful to say we're not speaking about other issues like whether the state needs to bless this by allowing marriage. I think it. I think Ted Olson probably is, is right in what had to be his guess going into this case that if faced with that question, Justice Kennedy, in the end, would vote to uphold the right to same-sex marriage. I know that's against the betting wisdom. Almost every law professor in America will say to Kennedy would never go along with this. But if you think about it, Justice Kennedy, who is such a remarkable figure on the court, has almost always voted with the gay rights side. And he did so even last term in another sleeper case, Christian Legal Society versus Martinez. This was a case about whether the University of California at Hastings Law School could exclude a Christian legal organization because it had a, the law school had a policy that if your organization is going to have student recognition and funding from the law school, it has to admit all students. And, and that really does mean the Republicans have to admit Democrats, and it means that a Christian organization can't exclude people it thinks are involved in sinful homosexual uh, conduct or beliefs. And in that case, the court totally flipped on its axis. It's another one of these topsy-turvy cases in which the advocacy of the free speech rights of the Christian organization, even against a condition on funding, comes from conservatives who usually think it's fine to put conditions on funding. The four votes that you couldn't condition funding on, on, on adherence to the so-called all-comers policy came from judges who were perfectly fine with conditions in lots of other areas. You can't have national art endowment for the arts grants uh, unless you're decent. You can't have federal funding for your university unless you enforce the Solomon Amendment. Suddenly, conditions on funding are a bad thing. Whereas the so liberals who usually hate conditions on funding are all on the other side. Justice Ginsburg writes for the court and says, of course the government's free to do things with carrots it can't do with sticks. Uh, <laughs> even though she was on the other side in cases like Rust v. Sullivan, which tried to say you, you, know, you, you can't give out family planning money. She, tried, she would have said you can't condition family planning money to doctors on their agreeing not to cancel abortion. So everybody's flipped. Where does Justice Kennedy wind up? He votes with Justice Ginsburg. He votes against free speech, which he normally loves. And he votes for conditions, which he normally is suspicious of, in order to allow University of Hastings College of Law, University of California at Hastings College of Law, to enforce equal protection for gay students. It was a very anomalous decision, and I think it suggests that in the end, when Justice Kennedy's uh, his historical record is written, and his tenure on the court being the swing vote in so many important cases is decided, he will not want his epitaph to say, I was for gay sex, but not for gay marriage. <laughs> <laughs>
I, I, I will say this. I, you know, I've, I've never understood the concern by the gay rights groups about Justice Kennedy here. I agree with that assessment. You can't read Romer versus Evans, the Colorado Proposition 1 case, or Lawrence versus Texas, uh, the Texas sodomy case, both written by Justice Kennedy, and not see a strong predisposition here. That said, um, uh, there's, there's something that's happened with Judge Walker's opinion um, that may have been three steps too far. Uh, and and the, 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 the parallel I want to draw here was, is Justice Kennedy's um, uh, joint opinion in Planned Parenthood versus Casey with David Souter and Sandra Day O'Connor kind of reaching a reconciliation on the abortion question. And within a couple of terms, they repudiated, at least from his point of view, that agreement, that reconciliation in the partial birth abortion cases. And he reacted fairly vehemently the other direction. Uh, uh, and I suspect when you look at Judge Walker's opinion that says procreation has never been a part of marriage in history, um, that there is no relevance whatsoever to genders in the institution of marriage, that that may provoke a reaction from Justice Kennedy. And you add to that another place where Kennedy reacted. And this is a completely unrelated context, but 10, 15 years ago, well, 25 years ago, we had a case in, uh, out of New York City that if you were uh, uh, g getting special ed education services um, and you wanted to get religious instruction, you couldn't do it in the, in the school classroom. You had to do it out in the bus out front. And, and the New York City school district in the middle of winter was spending tens of millions of dollars trying to bust these portable classrooms all along to comply with this um, decision of the Supreme Court. And by 97, it just became so patently clear that this was not working that the lower courts overruled the Supreme Court <laughs> and said you can't do that. And so we know you said that back then, but there's been a lot of cases in the meantime that suggest you would agree with overruling that. And the court, uh, the court very strongly said, you don't get to be the one that makes that call. We're the only ones that get to make that call. Well, the same thing has gone on here. In 1972, the Supreme Court uh, on a, in, a, in a merits context, so it was a dismissal of an appeal, but that's a ruling on the merits, rejected the identical claim uh, that same-sex marriage violates due process and equal protection requirements of the 14th Amendment. Now, it was 40 years ago. There's been a lot of water under the bridge since then, in Kennedy opinions, but Judge Walker doesn't even cite that decision. So overruling the Supreme Court uh, without even citing it uh, is, is something that's, that's I think, going to be troubling to Justice Kennedy, even if he would, would have begun from the proposition that he would like to go that way. Uh, and, and it also puts into context this notion about standing uh, in, the, in the context. Uh, and, and the standing issue may get this case up to the court this term. If, if come the argument first week of December, the Ninth Circuit says, we don't have any jurisdiction to hear this, I could see an emergency uh, cert petition going to the Supreme Court yet this term. If they wait and decide it on the merits, it'll be next year before it gets to the Supreme Court. Um, but on the standing issue, the fact that you've got governing Supreme Court precedent on your side and the Attorney General and the Governor of this state won't take a notice of appeal is different than the run of a mill. We lost the case. The merits are really weak for us. We're not going to take it. Uh, and particularly in the context of an initiative where Schwarzenegger and Brown were both on the other side of the issue, you end up with, with, with at stake the very power of the initiative. Can a single government official effectively veto a duly enacted initiative just because they didn't like it when you have governing Supreme Court precedent on your side? Um, and so I, you know, all of this is going to be tied up in, in that thing. It, it makes for some very interesting jurisdictional issues that overlay the underlying merits issues of the case. So with that, we will turn it over to you to answer questions that you might have. Yeah. I have two related questions. Speak up so um, everybody can speak. I have two related questions, both about Justice Kagan. Um, um, I read somewhere that she is going to have to recuse herself from more than half of the cases that they've agreed to hear so far this term. And I know you, Professor Eastman, touched on that. But I was wondering, first of all, whether you think that's going to have any sort of long-term effect on the jurisprudence. And secondly, is that just a temporary thing that's going on this term, or is that likely to continue in future terms? 
Well, the first is I think it is temporary. It's because she won't have been working on cases and she's not recusing herself because of financial holdings that she has. So it's really, I think, a question for the near term. And, and so. Yeah, so, so, so several of these cases are, are going to be fairly equally divided. And the fact that Justice Kagan is uh, uh, recused because of her work on the case in the Solicitor General's office uh, increases by a little bit the prospect that you end up with a 4-4 split. Uh, and when that happens, the lower court decision is affirmed uh, on its court. But, but given the political dynamic, I mean, she's replacing Stevens. And if these cases were 5-4 before, they're either going to be 5-3 uh, with her or 4 no, or 3-5 the other direction, I mean, depending on what Kennedy does. So I don't think there will be that many 4-4s four as a result of her recusal in these things. Other questions? Yes. Yeah, hi, I thought the discussion of the Phelps case. If you'll stand up, I think people can hear you better. The discussion of the Phelps case was surprising to me because it wasn't exactly that they were anti war. In fact, they talked about the fact that they supported U.S. involvement against Iraq and Afghanistan because of the primacy of Christianity over Islam. Their, their, their complaint was that American soldiers would die in hell because the United States supports gay rights. Most of those most of those signs were God hates fag signs. So I'm just wondering in that case, since you didn't discuss that aspect of it, firstly, does it matter whether they're federal soldiers, United States soldiers versus say state park rangers? Secondly, does it matter whether it's a civil penalty or a civil uh, damages or a criminal case? And thirdly. If it were that they were anti-war and they were protesting U.S. involvement, at least there would be a connection between the death of these service members and the war, whereas this goes to an entirely different issue. So I was just wondering about those three things. Are, are any of those three or all those three significant? Well, I, could, I, could I, I think you raise a very important clarification that the, the bizarre facts of yep. this case is that the, the so-called protests actually have nothing to do with the funeral of the American soldier or position on war. They have to do with this completely other agenda about being anti-gay. And it winds up having the disconnect that caused the emotional distress here. That God, the father is burying his son who died in Iraq, who is not gay and has nothing to do with anything gay. And this funeral is being used as the vehicle for this anti-gay agenda. It's not like these people are protesting outside San Francisco City Hall when Mayor Newsom is handing out wedding rings to same-sex couples. It's completely unrelated. But I think that the key that's been touched on by both Rebecca and John so far to this case is that free speech does not extend to interpersonal harassment. There's no free speech right to make an obscene phone call. There's no free speech right to stand outside the home of a doctor who performs abortions shouting out loud so his kids can't sleep that he's an, a, a murderer. And there's no right to even protest noisily outside an abortion clinic. The Supreme Court has recognized a notion that when we are captive audiences inside a place where we deserve repose, First Amendment rights don't extend free speech there. So the question is here, I think, whether this, rather than being perceived as a public protest on a volatile issue the way it would have been outside City Hall during the gay marriage uh, celebrations uh, in San Francisco, that might have been speech. But when it's targeted at a funeral, which is essentially a private event in a public space that's really akin to a hospital room or a home, it does the free speech stop there? Is it a clash between rights, as John put it earlier? And so I, I think that's really the, the, the irrelevance of the speech to the funeral and the sacred nature of the funeral to the family will probably drive the court in, in, in at least considering a restriction on speech or they wouldn't consider in another setting where that speech might be protected, whether or not you agree with it. I don't think the other two points you do raise will matter. It doesn't matter that they're federal and not state. I don't think there's a real federal state in, issue here. And civil damages can violate the First Amendment just as much as criminal penalties. That's New York Times against Sullivan, which was basically tort actions, defamation actions. I, I think this is going to be one of the most fascinating cases of the term, but I think one of the things that makes it so hard to figure out is why would anyone conceive a protest and put it in a place where it has so little to do with the nature of the, the, the thing that you're, you're speaking like, about. Like that's what caused the emotional It's like Willie distress. Horton. Why rob a bank? Because that's where the money is. Why do the protest there? Because that that's what Sutton. we're Willie Sutton. Willie Sutton. What did I say? I'm sorry. Oh. 
Uh, Willie Sutton, yes. But why, why, why go to the protest there? Because that's where you're going to get on the front pages of the papers. But, but I, I do agree. I don't think it's the content that they're going to be restricting if they go my way on this. I think they're going to come up with something more akin to a time, place, and manner restriction. Or a captive audience. Or a captive audience. One of those two that will allow them to reconcile these two very significant and competing interests. Uh, yes, right there. Are any, any of the cases coming up such oh, are any of the cases coming up such that there's any possibility that the Supreme Court will uh, allow um, television or at least live broadcast of the oral argument, <laughs> uh, particularly in light of I think Judge Justice Kagan had indicated sympathy with the idea. Well, it's the last branch that you can't see on TV. There, you don't have televised press conferences the way you do with the presidency, you don't have C-SPAN. And the court uh, across party lines has loved its anonymity so much so that some of you may have read the story about Justice Souter being up in New Hampshire and being spotted by people in the diner and they said, we know who you are, you're that Supreme Court Justice. And he said, yes I am. And they said, you're Justice Breyer. <laughs> <laughs> so went along with it for a minute, and then, uh, uh, he then they then said, well, what's your favorite thing about working on the Supreme Court? And he said, I'd have to say my favorite thing about working at the Supreme Court is the opportunity I have to serve with Justice David Souter. <laughs> <laughs> I think, think of that story as, you know, which uh, it, it, it's a reminder that these, uh, these are the most powerful people in America that nobody can recognize in the diner because they're not on television. Would it be a service to the country to see the arguments? I think it absolutely would. I think a lot of them might be boring and technical in a lot of respects. It's not as riveting as seeing a trial with witnesses talking about a homicide or something like that. But I think the few moments where the court has permitted tape delayed uh, audio feeds of the arguments coupled with artists' drawings of who was speaking. It's a little bit like a, watching a golf match. That's Justice Scalia with the nine iron. <laughs> uh, that, that, that I think is, 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 is riveting for those cases and a huge public education. And uh, I think it would be a good thing for the court. But I think it's the desire to preserve anonymity, not to uh, create, to, to maintain the kind of sense that the court is only what its reasoned opinions state. It's not about personalities, it's not about hair and teeth, the way some other chambers of government are, and it's not about politicking. And, and it, it will go sometime, I'm just not sure it will go anytime soon. And, I, and I'll, I'll add a, to Justice Thomas' anonymity story. You know, he's got a, one of these big travel tour buses that he and his wife and, and children like to travel around on in the summers. And inevitably, while well, he's filling it with gas, and these things take 50 or 60 gallons, somebody will come up to him and say, you know, you look an awful lot like that Justice Thomas up at the Supreme Court. He said, oh, buddy, I get that a lot of times. <laughs> um, uh, but I, I, don't, I think the odds that this court uh, is going to open up for television cameras anytime soon is zero. I mean, they just there's. I mean, Justice Kagan suggested it during her confirmation hearings, but but she'll quickly be disabused of that when she gets up <laughs> up there. Um, and 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 the concern is that it would alter the nature of their work. Um, that they would be uh, uh, appealing to the camera, focusing on issues that are that that are going to be uh, more interesting for the popular consumption, rather than the very technical legal issues that is dry, but is by and large the day-to-day -day work that that court does. And I, they've resisted it so as not to succumb to that, which they, you know, just human nature being what it is. If you've got a camera on, you're going to try and look good. You're going to ask the question that no, you know, that maybe you wouldn't have asked otherwise because it'll show how smart you are and da da da. I mean, that I mean, people are, and they're and they're concerned about that, and I, I think somewhat legitimately. Rebecca, did you want to add something? No, just one. I was just going to say the same. One down, uh, eight to go. I don't see it happening, and I think it's also about the attorney's behavior as well as the justices. Of, you know, changing their behavior is also something they don't want to do. That seems so overstated. The state Supreme Courts have live yeah. webcasts of their oral arguments all the time, and uh, it doesn't seem to have altered the way right. that state jurisprudence is conducted. But they're just, I, it's one of those ways in which they're a little bit retro in that. I mean, I just like the technology. I just can't picture. But maybe with, with you know, addition of younger people over the next years, you could see it perhaps. I don't know. I like the line drawings of the artists. <laughs> <laughs> we have time for one more question. Yes, the young man in the... Um, Justice Stevens... Sorry, Wait for the mic. Oh, she's sprinting over there too. <laughs> <laughs> Justice Stevens, I'm sorry. Uh, 
Well, thank you all for coming. And uh, Justice Stevens was known as being a particularly effective coalition builder on the court, and he'd often also use his assignment power very strategically, usually assigning things to either O'Connor or to Kennedy as the swing votes to keep them intact. But his retirement now leaves Justice Kennedy the senior in a liberal majority if he chooses to vote with the liberals. So I guess I have two questions is, do we think that uh, there'll be fewer liberal decisions without this great coalition builder? And then also, on the other side of that, um, do we think that Justice Kennedy will be maybe more inclined to vote with the liberal bloc to give himself the power to assign the opinion or to assign himself the opinion, maybe? Mm, interesting. Great question. Very sophisticated question. Yeah. You're so lucky on the USC, at the USC Law School to have one of Justice Stevens' great law clerks on the faculty, Susan Estrich. And I think Susan would probably tell you that Justice Stevens, when he was a coalition builder, didn't do it by walking the hallways like an old New Jersey politician. Justice Brennan used to say, what's the most important rule at the Supreme Court? The rule of five. But I think Stevens just relied on his powers of persuasion and his writing and his courtliness. And, and it, he wasn't buttonholing people in the lobby. So I don't think that necessarily changes. As You're absolutely right. Everybody understands that the senior judge in the justice in the majority has the power to assign the opinion. If that's not the chief justice, it goes to the next highest uh, member with the next highest seniority. If there's a political split and Justice Kennedy's on the liberal, so-called liberal side, he could assign it to himself. It is hard to imagine how he would get more assignments <laughs> than he's already gotten <laughs> because so often to get the five, he has to be given the opinion to write it in a way that's moderate enough to, 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 to you know, reach that decision. But I think you're onto something very important that Justice Stevens' departure from the court, maybe this is a great way for everybody to close. I mean, he had a monumental career. We should, we should just all take a moment to reflect on a man from the great generation, a man who fought in World War II, who voted against the right to burn a flag, and yet also against the power of the government to change the rules of military justice in Guantanamo no doubt based in both those positions, on, in part on his service. Uh, a member of the generation who I won a case from it, which many people have thanked me, which allows wine to be shipped from wineries out of state. Uh, New Yorkers are especially grateful. Californians didn't need it as much. But he dissented from that case, saying, for those of us who remember prohibition, and that's not something that any other member of the court can, not, not something any other member of the court could, could, uh, could say. But I think if you were to think about somebody who combined the virtues of a trial lawyer who always knew everything in the record, with a kind of judgment and balance and a way to not go to extremes in cases, with a passion for things he cared deeply about, which were not just you know, the First Amendment rights of Jehovah's Witnesses, but were also the rights of antitrust plaintiffs <laughs> and their ability to go after cartels. And this was a remarkable tenure on the court. And I think when he leaves, he, yes, he's leaving the senior position to assign things. He's also leaving a, a tremendous legacy of, of, of cases and, and decisions that uh, you know, really uh, marked a, a, an incredible tenure, and the court will not be the same without him. He was the most courtly of gentlemen. He never raised his voice, was always civil, always made advocates feel as if uh, they were the most important person in the rule, room. And we can be certain of one thing, there will be nobody else on the court who wears bow ties to work. <laughs> <Thank you. laughs> John or Beck, any concluding thoughts? Yeah, I want to pick up on that. When, when I argued the uh, uh, Castle Rock case a few years ago, and he said, why won't you give me that piece? Uh, you know, or why are you fighting Scalia so hard on that? He's handing you. And I said, because if I do what Scalia wants, I lose Justice Kennedy and probably everybody else as well. Uh, but he was, you know, it, it was a dynamic from, in the argument that was just wonderful because he was there. Um, but I think in, in some way, um, the combination of Sotomayor and Kagan replace him. Uh, Sotomayor with, the, with the, the trial lawyer prosecutor experience, uh, she's the only one that had that, that, that level of experience on the court now. But also Stevens, I think, um, played the long game looking at the consequences of ranges of opinions that, that, that many mere mortals just didn't see lined up. But he would see something in this line of cases that affected this line of cases over here and make connections. And was playing a long three steps, four steps, ten steps out um, uh, kind of doctrinal game uh, in his jurisprudence. Um, and, and I think Justice Kagan may step into that. There's a very academic aspect to that. So the, pro the combination of the two uh, is an interesting replacement uh, for, for those two roles that Justice Stevens played pre pre pretty significantly over a very long time.
Rebecca, any closing um, thoughts? I think that's a good place to stop. I'm very excited to see what Justice Kagan does with her um, opportunity, but we probably won't see too much from her as she gets her feet wet or whatever, gets her bearings, but Justice Stevens is a very tough act to follow. What's the old line? You spend the first five years wondering how you got there and the rest of the time wondering how everybody else did. <laughs> <laughs> Let us thank our terrific panelists, John, Kathleen, and Rebecca. On behalf of the university, thank you for coming here tonight. Thank you. We'll see you next year.